Bess Marshall. So I'm also from St. Louis, which could be in the beginning. And I'm a pediatric endocrinologist. And so I am part of the Natural History Clinic. I supervise the sort of medical care of the patients while they're in St. Louis. Um, and then I <coughs> follow along with the, with the data on diabetes and diabetes insipidus and other endocrinologic problems. So I know that when you have Wolfram syndrome, you probably know a lot more about diabetes and diabetes insipidus than somebody who doesn't have diabetes or diabetes insipidus, which is me. But, um, so, but I will tell you what data we've collected from our patients. And um, you can fill us in on any insights that you have. So this is a picture of St. Louis Children's Hospital. That's where we see our patients. So, um, so this is just a summary of the patients that we have seen. Um, these are up to 2017, so it doesn't include the most recent years. Um, but so far we have 23 women and seven men, or girls and boys. The age range is pretty, is pretty wide, as we saw from Dr. Hershey's data. Um, so this is just these patients, and someone had asked earlier about the, the age of the clinic patients. So when we originally designed the study, we wanted to select patients who were likely to progress quickly enough in their disease symptoms that we would be able to see a change over a relatively short period of time. So we intentionally chose people with early onset disease. So it is a selected group who are who are probably more severe than the, than the average person with, with Wolfram syndrome. <coughs> it was also long enough ago that the diagnosis at that point was primarily made by clinical symptoms. So we were only diagnosed with Wolfram syndrome to get into the clinic if you already had diabetes and optic atrophy. Um, so this, this data is probably a more severe group of people than, than just the entire group of people who have Wolfram syndrome. So this is the patients as they are developing the various symptoms of Wolfram syndrome. So the bottom um, axis is age, starting with age zero and going up to age 30. And so the blue line is development of diabetes mellitus. The red line is diabetes insipidus. And then green is diagnosis of optic atrophy. Some of the patients probably certainly had optic atrophy prior to the diagnosis, but this was when doctor diagnosed them with that. And then same with the hearing loss diagnosis. So you see that over time, by about age five, about half of these patients already had um, diabetes. And then for diabetes insipidus, half of them had it by about age 10. So a pretty early onset group. So we do see a little bit of a gender difference, which I think is in agreement with what other groups and even some animal models show. So um, the males tend to develop symptoms at slightly earlier ages. So in this case, this is all diabetes mellitus, and the red is the, um, is the boys. I got the colors backwards, that's silly, but so the, the blue is the girls. <laughs> so, so the boys do uh, develop diabetes slightly younger age. So this is hemoglobin A1C. So some of our patients do better than others. So in, in the US scale, we do hemoglobin A1C by percent, how much hemoglobin A1C compared to the total amount of hemoglobin. So this green bar is where we would like to see our patients in the range from six to seven and a half for children. And then once they hit adulthood, then between six and seven. So this is pretty normal for pediatric patients. They're sort of teenage years, they lose control. I think that is not specific to Wolfram syndrome. Um, and then as they get older and sort of learn their diabetes better, they, they get under better control. But there's a wide range. We do have a few people who don't have diabetes. And we have one person who actually developed diabetes after they enrolled in the clinic. So when they initially started, they were only five and didn't have diabetes yet, but we actually <coughs> saw them develop diabetes uh, after they enrolled in the clinic. So um, we inquire about severe episodes for, for patients. And so one of the acute complications of diabetes is diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, and the, the 
num the percent of people with Wolfram diabetes who have ketoacidosis is lower than the percent of people with type 1 diabetes who have ketoacidosis. So in our group, only about one out of three have experienced ketoacidosis, whereas with type 1 diabetes, it would be much higher. It probably wouldn't be 100%, but it would be close. Um, so it's not, um, not <clears throat> typical of type 1 diabetes. So to assess our patients' diabetes um, as part of the clinic, we do what's called a mixed meal test, which Fumi also mentioned. So we have the patients come in first thing in the morning before they eat their breakfast and before they take their morning insulin. And we draw blood and measure their glucose and their C-peptide. So C-peptide is a way to measure how much insulin the person is making on their own. So most of these people are taking insulin. So if we draw an insulin level, we're gonna be measuring both what they make and also whatever they took in their shot most recently. So C-peptide is secreted with insulin from your pancreas in the equal amounts. And so you can measure C-peptide and get an idea how much of their insulin is what they produce themselves. So we measure that when they're fasting and then we give them this milkshake sort of drink that is it's a pretty high carbohydrate load. It's, it's also got some protein and fat. So they drink that their blood sugar goes up and, and that is a stimulus for insulin secretion. So 30 minutes after they drink that, we draw that blood test again, and then at that point we let them take their insulin because by then usually their blood sugar is pretty high and they don't prefer that obviously. So what we see is that early on in the di di after, or early on after the diagnosis of diabetes, the people are still making a fairly significant amount of C-peptide. So this is C-peptide on this axis, and this is how long the person has had diabetes. So the people who have just recently been diagnosed with diabetes are still making quite a bit of C-peptide. This person up here doesn't yet have diabetes at these two points, but they developed it here. So that person was getting diabetes. If you test somebody who's not diabetic at all and doesn't have any risk factors for diabetes, it's going to be higher than these, um, but, but not a ton higher than this. So, so what we see is sort of a gradual decline over, definitely over the first 10 years after diagnosis, but then after that, the levels of C-peptide are very low. So it's these people who have the highest risk of complications like diabetic ketoacidosis, and these people are a little bit less likely because they can still generate a little insulin on their own. But this also gives us, at least in that first five or 10 years after diagnosis, it gives us something that we can track in terms of a biomarker for progression of the disease. So once you've had diabetes for too long, then you're already too low. There's not gonna be any further change. But early on, if you gave an intervention that was able to stop this further decline, that you could use that as a marker that that intervention would help. So, so C-peptide early on is, a, is a correlated with the duration of diabetes. And it's a fairly predictable decline in that first five years. So it is something you can use as a marker in progression. So diabetes insipidus tends to be a little later of onset, um, but again, the, the red is, is males and the red is females, so slightly earlier ages of onset in boys. So this scale is the same. This is age, and this is the percent of people who have diabetes insipidus. So the, in, at this point, 100% are unaffected, and as more are affected, the, the curve goes down. So another big issue that impacts the care of both diabetes and diabetes insipidus is bladder dysfunction. So this is something that's also very common uh, in our patients with Wolfram syndrome. And so many of our patients are <coughs> having to go to the bathroom very, very frequently. So in somebody who only has diabetes insipidus, if you're having to go to the bathroom very frequently, usually that means that your diabetes insipidus is out of control and you may need to adjust your dose of desmopressin. But if your bladder is dysfunctioning, you may be going to the bathroom very frequently because of something wrong with your bladder. And so 
we have had problems with people getting a low sodium level or hyponatremia because they kept raising their desmopressin dose to try to have to go to the bathroom less often when the problem really wasn't that, it was really that their bladder was not working right. So we ask our patients to keep a diary of how many times they go to the bathroom in a day and how much they avoid, how many milliliters. And we get a wide range, as you can see. So in a day's time, this is urine volume up to four liters, and this is the number of times they had to go to the bathroom. So some people are going almost 10 times a day, and there are people actually that are even farther above this um, that I didn't put on the record. Um, but some of the people who are going very frequently are not making a very large volume of urine. So this person is going to the bathroom very often, but not because of their diabetes insipidus. They're having a bladder dysfunction problem. So they don't need to keep raising their dose of desmopressin. They need to do something about their bladder. So a pretty large number of our patients who are in a situation like this end up self-catheterizing to, um, to empty their bladder because their bladder is just not emptying properly. So, when you're talking about diabetes insipidus, not only in Wolfram, but anything, there's a couple of terms that you need to know. So, polyuria means you're making too much urine volume. Um, urinary frequency is how often you actually go and enter your bladder. So, if you have a high blood sugar, that will also cause polyuria. So, that just adds to the difficulty of dealing with urinary problems in the Rem syndrome is you is your blood sugar maybe high and that also makes you go to the bathroom too often. That also eliminates one of the ways we usually help manage diabetes insipidus. So with diabetes insipidus, the problem is your kidneys can't concentrate your urine. So there's a pretty easy test. There's a little dipstick test to see if your urine is concentrated or not. And so somebody who has diabetes insipidus may use that dipstick to see if they need to take a dose of, vas of vasopressin. So if they do the dipstick and their urine is very concentrated, then they know they've got enough vasopressin. They know, don't need to take another dose. So, but if you have diabetes mellitus, if there's glucose in your urine, it's going to make the dipstick really concentrated, even though your urine may actually not be that concentrated. It's just that it's got sugar in it. So that sort of eliminates that. Um, as an easy diagnostic test for somebody with, with Wolfram. Um, but obviously diabetes insipidus can cause polyuria. And so polyuria can cause urinary frequency. If you're making a very large amount of urine, you're gonna have to go to the bathroom a lot. So you know, if you drink a ton of, if you don't have Wolfram syndrome, drink a ton of water, you have to go to the bathroom a lot because you're making a lot of urine. Um, but if you do have Wolfram, you may have polyuria because your diabetes insipidus is not under control. So bladder dysfunction can also cause urinary frequency. It doesn't cause polyuria. So if your bladder, and there's different kinds of bladder dysfunction in Wolfram syndrome. Some people's bladder becomes what's called atonic, which means it just becomes large and stretched out and so it has a hard time emptying just because it's so large. Other people's bladder is more of a spastic bladder, so it's not necessarily enlarged, but it just thinks it's supposed to be emptying all the time, and so they may very frequently go to the bathroom and have a small amount of urine. And the bladder may not empty all the way, and so then pretty soon they'll have to go again because it didn't empty all the way the first time. So, so just bladder dysfunction causes urinary frequency. So, there are some people in our clinic who also seem to lose salt. And I don't know if Tim sees this as well, but especially some of our older patients eat a huge amount of salt. Some of them do it just because voluntarily, when, you're, when, your, serum salt, <coughs> when your serum salt level goes down, a person whose system is working normally will start to crave salt. And so some of our people actually crave salt. So they, put a ton of salt and they eat a lot of chips and crisps with, with a lot of salt in them. Um, other people actually have to take salt tablets because they don't crave the salt, but they need the salt and they'll get low sodiums without it. Um, 
So that seems to be a problem, not so much with the diabetes insipidus as with something wrong with their kidneys. And we haven't really studied that in enough detail. We're hoping to recruit a fellow actually who will take that on as her, as her project. But, um, but that seems to, to, in our patients, is occurring in the patients who are, say, over age 25. So after they've had, had Wolfram symptoms for a pretty long time. And once that starts, then their requirement for desmopressin seems to go very, very low. So it's something else that's going wrong that, that we don't exactly have a finger on. So it just adds to the frustration that people have with trying to deal with this problem. <coughs> so treatment of, of diabetes insipidus, as you know, in the US we call it DDAVP. It's desmopressin, it's the little tablet. There's also a nose spray, there's an injectable form. Um, and people with Wolfram syndrome seem to vary in their sensitivity to the, to the medication. As I said, especially in the older ones, they may just take a tiny, tiny dose. Um, whereas younger people may take a really unusually large amount. Um, so when they are trying to decide what their dose needs to do, do they need more, do they need less, we ask them to both watch their urine volume for a day and we also watch their sodium levels. Um, we tried for a while to get home sodium monitors for people, the way people have home blood sugar monitors. They exist, but they're not really made for home use. Uh, so far, we haven't been able to, to get any insurance to pay for those, but they cost, last time I checked, if you buy them on eBay, they're about $25,000. And then for each test, it's about $100. So. So far, no insurance companies going for that. So they still have to go to the to the lab and get blood drawn. But um, but some people have to check their sodium fairly often to keep themselves out of trouble. Um, for bladder care, I think the most important thing is to make the diagnosis. When our clinic first started, I think we really didn't appreciate how much of a problem this was. Um, and I we had a few of our older patients who had had bladder surgery to either to enlarge their bladder or to put in an artificial what's called an ostomy where they could catheterize their bladder through their abdominal wall. Um, but just a couple of much older patients. Um, now a very large percent of our patients are catheterizing themselves to try to prevent uh, kidney problems because we do have a couple of our older patients who have clearly developed some kidney dysfunction. So, um, so I think we have to be very aware that we may need um, to be advising more people early on to uh, either do catheterization or some other way to keep their bladder empty. So for bladder, we ask them to watch their urinary frequency. So the volume and the frequency are the keys to trying to figure out which thing is keeping you up all night going to the bathroom every hour. Um, Later on, as I said, you may also have to watch your sodium intake. So I don't know if it's so common in Europe, but in the US, diet fads are very common. So a couple of our patients, they, they social media each other all the time, and so they got very interested in the paleo diet. So the paleo diet turns out to very low sodium. So one of our patients particularly got repeatedly admitted to the hospital with very low sodium. And we finally figured out, you just need to take sodium. You need to take salt pills because he wouldn't lose the paleo diet. And so we said, all right, you have to eat salt. Um, so all of this data comes from Dr. Hershey's study. And all of those people on her slide and on Fumi's slide contributed to this. But I just selected out a few of the people who specifically have worked on, especially on the neurologic uh, issues. Um, so Paul Austin was one of our pediatric <coughs> urologists who's actually moved to another institution now. Um, but Kyle Rowe and Gino Richella have, have uh, contributed to the neurologic data. And my partner, Neil White, is another endocrinologist who um, works with the endocrinologic aspects. Um, so I have to thank all of them and our funding agencies as well, of course. So I think that's it for me. That's St. Louis. <laughs>